Amen and amen. How many of you were blessed by the music? I know I was. And again, I want to also say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and soon to be mothers. That includes my wife. And also for my mom who is watching online all the way from Massachusetts. I just want to say happy Mother's Day. I'm glad that you all are here worshiping with us this morning. And so before I begin today, I want to begin with a word of prayer. So if you wouldn't mind, please join me in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us here this morning to worship you with music, with prayer, and now as we begin to open your word, Lord, we just ask that you, your presence continues to abide with us, Lord. We pray that our worship will have already brought glory to your name, and we pray that it just continues to do so. Lord, please bless us with your spirit. Let the words that I say be inspired by you, and may it bring conviction to our hearts and Lord, let us live faithfully to you for the rest of our lives. Please be with us now. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I want to ask you all, when was the last time you were amazed? When was the last time you had that feeling of, wow, and you got, like, your jaw dropped. You were just in awe of what you were looking at or something that you may have heard. Like, this past week, my wife and I went to the doctors for the anatomy scan for our child that is slowly developing, yet it seems so fast. Like, it's crazy to think, right, that this child that is forming in her womb started off even smaller than that. And now, when you go and you have the ultrasound and, you're, and they're looking at all the different parts, it was really neat. You could see the spinal cord and all the vertebrae in it. And it's like, wow, I didn't see that the last time at the ultrasound because we had one beforehand. And, you know, as the baby continues to develop, you can just see the different parts. And, uh, by the way, we're waiting to know the gender, so we do not know. But we will know once the baby is born. But that just, when we were there, we were just both in awe. And I imagine, and it's becoming more real for me, like when a parent sees their child first walk. It's not that impressive. You're expecting them to walk or maybe to talk at some point. Yet it is amazing. You stand in awe. Or maybe you're at a sporting event, like last night. You didn't know I was going to include this in the sermon today, but Felicity ran track yesterday afternoon, and she was going so fast. Uh, I am not a runner. And it was like a bullet. You just see some of the people just go off, and it's like, whoa, you're amazed at how quick she ran, especially when you take into the fact she is a freshman running with seniors, and she's keeping up with them. But also, you may have seen videos of people doing amazing things. There are YouTube channels specifically dedicated to the amazing things that humans are doing and have done. We seek to be in awe. There are channels where some people even give away thousands of dollars, which is crazy. Some people give away sports cars, jets, all this stuff, and it's like, what? Where do you get this kind of money to be able to do that? You're just in awe. I remember hearing one time where someone was giving a commencement speech. This person was wealthy, and part of his commencement speech was to say he paid for everyone who was graduating's debt. Wow, wow, exactly. I remember hearing that going, man, why didn't he speak at our commencement speech? But the point is, is that we seek to be in awe. We seek to be amazed. And did you know 
that there is a moment in Scripture in which Jesus had that same feeling. He was amazed. And you know what's in, it's fascinating? When you're reading the Gospel of Matthew and you're reading through, right, many times you find it's not so much Jesus who is amazed. It's everyone else who is amazed by Jesus. You have the disciples. They're hearing him teach. They're amazed by what he's saying. The crowds are amazed by which authority he is speaking. And then also when he walks on water, he calms the storm, and they're just in awe. When Peter was called, when he was doubting about the Lord, and the Lord said, cast your net. And a huge, bountiful amount of fish came into that net. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. He was in awe of Jesus. Many times you find people amazed. Even Pilate was amazed by Jesus. But rarely, rarely do you find Jesus amazed. In fact, you find him only amazed once. Only explicitly in Scripture where it says he is amazed once. And it's the passage that we are going to read today. There is one other example, but what I'm talking about as far as being amazed is a, is a sense of positive amazement. There is a, a, an example in Mark 6, 6 where it says Jesus is amazed by the, his own people in Nazareth, their lack of faith. But what I'm talking about is the moments, the one moment in Scripture where it explicitly says Jesus is amazed in a positive way. And so if you have your Bibles, open please to Matthew chapter 8. That's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time this morning is in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. That's where we're going to be starting, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. And I like to make sure people are following along with me. And so I'm going to ask you to let me know when you're there. You can say amen or just, just let me know that you're following along with me. So when you're there, please say amen or something. All right. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5, we find the story of the centurion. Many of you may have read this story, heard this story preached many times but what's interesting is, is up to this point, right, in Matthew's gospel, what you have found is that John the Baptist has baptized Jesus. He has gone through the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by the devil. Afterwards, he was in Syria doing amazing things, healing many people. And then Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7 is the most famous sermon of all known as the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus literally pick any part of it, and it's better than any sermon I'm ever going to give. It was that amazing. It was breathtaking to see and to probably have heard that message that morning or afternoon, whenever it was. But now we come to a section of healing stories, and that's where we pick up our chapter our story in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. It says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And now pay attention to these next words in verse 10. This is where the theme, the, the focal point, the trampoline into the message this morning, where I will be focusing primarily on is in this verse. Remember this. When Jesus heard this, what does it say? He was amazed. He was in awe. He had a jaw-dropping moment 
he was in a way surprised to see what this centurion did. And the question that this should be asking or begging us to investigate is why? Why was Jesus amazed? What caused him to sort of take a step back and go, whoa, this is different. I haven't seen this before. And plus, we should also be asking the question, wouldn't you want to have that commendation from Jesus? Wouldn't you want that to be written down in the books of heaven, that Jesus was amazed by something you did? This is the point and the emphasis of this passage right here. Jesus wants to be amazed. But the question is how? How? And that is where we will be looking into today. And in order to understand this, we need to understand who the centurion is. How did the Israelites view the Romans? even the centurions. I want to just share with you, just try to imagine, place yourself in that setting, that time period, in order to really appreciate and to understand why Jesus was amazed. We need to step into the shoes of the centurion and of the people of that day. You see, the Romans occupied the land of Israel. They occupied their holy land. These were pagans who had taken control over them. And the Jerusalem and Israel were subservient to them. And they were always seeking and wanting to be free. They always felt in a sense like they were captive to the Romans. Although they did have some freedom. The Romans taxed the people. The Romans killed many of their people. You see, the, wor- the, the list is getting worse and worse. Soldiers stole money through violence. You actually find this being shared in Luke's gospel, where John the Baptist is giving instruction as far as what the people are doing. Like He's calling people to repentance, and people are asking, what should I do? What should I do? And the soldiers came. And asked John the Baptist, what should I do? And listen to what he says. This is Luke 3, 14. It says, then some of the soldiers also asked him, and as for us, what should we do? And he told them, this is John the Baptist, take money from no one by violence or by false accusation and be content with your pay. John the Baptist was addressing an issue of the day, which is that soldiers tended to steal and to take money with violence from Jews. So you're starting to get a little more of a picture of who this centurion, the background of what people had viewed of the Romans and the centurions. These were sinners. These were not people born of Israelite birth. This was the animosity the Israelites had towards the Romans and the centurions. And it was so bad that you couldn't even share a meal. You couldn't associate with them, fellowship with them at all because they were considered unclean. To be associated with them would mean that you were unclean. And that is a no-no. And we know this because Peter was ridiculed for going into the home of a Gentile. Why did you do that? The accusation was. Why did you go into the house of the Gentiles? When you know, why did you go into uncircumcised men and share a meal? This was the animosity that the Jews had towards the Romans. And you kind of see a glimpse of this in our passage. In Matthew 8, 7, right, depending on the translation, it's it's kind of hard to figure out whether this was a question or a statement, and it can mean different things. It could mean... and. Verse 7, right, when you read it, in your translation, it may say, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Or it could be a question rather than a statement. Shall I come and heal him? And if you were to understand this as a question, if you were to understand this as a question, 
Jesus could have been potentially saying, shall I, a Jew, come into your home and heal him? Very much like later on, this story is very similar to the Canaanite woman. When the Canaanite woman came asking Jesus to heal her daughter, and the disciples were very prejudiced against her. But Jesus asked questions and probed her and pushed her, not to continue the prejudice, but to break the barriers of the prejudice. And so Jesus is ask, could be potentially asking him a question, shall I come and heal him, to let the centurion exemplify his faith, to demonstrate his faith. And lastly, if this wasn't already clear, this centurion is a Gentile. He is not an Israelite by birth and thus without the privileges of the Israelites. Listen to what Romans 9, actually, if you have your Bibles in your phone or actually a hardcover Bible, go to Romans chapter 9, verse 4. This is, I think, important for us to highlight, but keep your finger on Matthew 8, 5 as well. This is Romans 9, verse 4. And when you're there, please let me know. All right, perfect. Romans 9, 4 says, the people of Israel, this is just Paul describing the benefits of being an Israelite. Okay, pay attention. Theirs is the adoption of, to some to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. This is the benefit of being an Israelite, and guess who doesn't have that? Who doesn't have it? Okay, we can do better than that. Who doesn't have these benefits? The centurion does not have these benefits and these privileges. This, this centurion in this passage is what we would consider a person without any privilege, without the privilege of the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenants, the law, the temple worship. As far as hands are dealt... This Gentile was dealt the worst possible hand from a religious point of view. Yet, he exhibited more faith than those who were privileged. He exhibited more faith and trust in Jesus than the Israelites who had been privileged to be called children of God, the glory, the covenants, the law, the temple worship. And so, in spirit, in spite of all this, listen, listen to what the centurion says in response to Jesus' question, shall I come and heal him? The centurion, in verse, coming back to Matthew 8, in verse 8, we have the centurion replied, Lord, that's even weird, just stop there for a second. A centurion, a Roman centurion, is calling a Jew Lord. Okay? So, continuing, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. The centurion could have been potentially acknowledging that he understands that there is this prejudice. He could be saying, you know what, I understand as a Jew that you are, that, that there are those prejudices. But listen to what he says. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and to that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so my question to you all is, what was the basis of his faith? Was it Scripture? What scripture verse did he quote to Jesus? None. Absolutely none. 
So what was the basis of his faith? His own experience. This guy had no privilege whatsoever, but yet he acted upon what he knew. His own, and that's what's so amazing about this. This is why Jesus was amazed. This is why he declared, I have not found such great faith. This centurion believed Jesus in spite of the fact that he was an underprivileged Roman. And so my, one of my points for you this morning is this. Amaze Jesus with your faith by not being indifferent to the privilege you have. I'll say that again. Amaze Jesus with your faith by not being indifferent to the privilege you have. What was great about the centurion's faith was not so much about the amount he had, but how he used the little he had. And let me ask you this this morning, because it's important that we don't just look at the passage and leave it in the past. It's important to make this into something that is present for us today. What privilege do you have this morning as Christians? What privilege do you have as Adventists? Think about that, right? We have a lot of privilege, very much like the Israelites. Even more so, because we believe in Jesus. We have a lot of light that God has shared and blessed us with. He has called this church into existence. For a specific purpose. And the question is, is are you living in the light of the privilege God has given you? Listen to the warning that Jesus shares with his own people, the Israelites. You know, when he makes this announcement that I have not found such great faith, he doesn't say this to the centurion. Did you catch that? He did he doesn't say I have not found such great faith, and he's speaking to the centurion. He actually turns to those who are following him, Israelites, because that's the people who Jesus came for. He turned to the Israelites and said to them, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. And then he continues in verse 11. I say to you that many will come from the east in the west, and will take their place, places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, there is a feast, and Jesus keeps this ever-present before the people's eyes, before even the centurion. The centurion is not Just, all right, he's not talking to me. I'm not listening at all. No, he's listening to this too. Although Jesus is addressing his own people, Gentiles were probably hearing this. And he is saying, listen, there is a feast that we get to look forward to in the kingdom made new. When God has come to establish his kingdom on earth, there is a feast in which you will sit with the patriarchs. You will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all those who have come before you in the kingdom of God, but the sons of the kingdom, the people who had been privileged with the adoption of sons, with the law, with the glory, the house of worship, all this, guess what? They're not there. Why? The answer is because they didn't live according to the privilege they had. They were indifferent to it. Whereas this centurion, the many who come from east and west, do live according to the light they have. They live according to the privilege that God has given them. And just because we start with, just because this centurion started with little to none, doesn't mean that Jesus wanted him to stay with little to none. 
Jesus wanted him to continue to grow in his faith, to learn to depend and to trust upon him more and more as his days continued. And that is the same desire that he has for us. We should be ever growing, just like what was, I think it was last week, right, Dr. Hannah? It was your sermon, press on in Christ. Don't, what? Stagnate, graduate. There is a problem with God's people, and it tends to happen repeatedly. This is the Laodicean message. We become indifferent. We become complacent to what God has blessed us with. We say, Lord, thank you so much for giving me all the desires that I want. Now let me hold it in and keep it all to myself. That tends to be the repeated theme. But what Jesus wants, and this is, although this is a warning in these verses, right? Jesus is saying, I want you to be there at the feast with me. He's giving this warning because he cares for us. He is saying, I want to be amazed by you. I want to be amazed with your faith. And so my appeal to you all is is amaze him with your faith by not being indifferent to the privilege that you have. Use it. Use it. My second point for you this morning is amaze Jesus with your faith in his divine authority. Amaze Jesus with your faith in his divine authority. You see, part of the response to the, that the centurion gives to Jesus when Jesus asks, shall I come and heal him? Listen, like, I don't know if you caught this. This is why it's so important to slow down sometimes and really pay attention and grasp the things that God is, the little treasure points in the the passage. And this was really, really neat to me when I was looking into this. So coming back to verse 8, it says, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man, what? under authority. So what is the centurion saying? I recognize my authority. I understand what that means for me as a Roman centurion. I command people under me. But guess what that means? Lord, you also have authority. And your authority is greater than mine. Like this is, again, this is why Jesus is amazed by this. He's basically saying, I believe you are capable of healing my servant. You don't have to come. All you have to do is speak, and it will happen, because you also are under authority. This is kind of a paraphrase in which the centurion is saying, if even I, a minor officer, can give commands, how much more can you? How much more can you? And if we were to apply this today, it's, it's like if, if we were to say, if I as a parent can give commands to my children, if I as a boss can give commands to my employees, if I as a teacher can give commands to my students, how much more can you? All these things you can do more and better than us. In this statement, a Gentile acknowledges Jesus as Lord and believes in his authority. He says, you are capable of doing all things, including healing my servant, because you have been given that authority on earth. No one else can do what I am asking, because God has given it to no one else. Only by your command and will may my servant be healed. And... We obviously find the next few verses where Jesus expresses, I'm amazed at your great faith. And he gives the warning to his own people. But upon hearing this centurion, he turns back after his little sort of side conversation with those who are following him. He turns back to the centurion and he says this in verse 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Friends, Jesus has all 
the authority. Great faith believes this and acts upon it. Jesus said, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. The centurion clearly went, as the story shows. It doesn't explicitly say it, but he had to have known because it's recorded that he was healed at that very moment, at that very hour. See, Jesus was able to command the servant to be healed because he has that divine authority. And you know what's amazing? If you stopped in that story, you would think, wow, that's amazing. But there's even a more amazing point, and it comes all the way at the end of Matthew's gospel. I don't know if you picked it up, the connection between this story and the end of Matthew's gospel. Go to Matthew 28 so you can see this. I'm not making this up. Matthew 28 all the way at the very end. We know this as the Great Commission. And it's often used as a form of motivating people to go and do the work of evangelism. We are to go and make disciples and things like that. But we, we start, I think, at the wrong place when we tell people about the Great Commission. Most of the times we tell people that Oh, start in um, verse 19, and that's the Great Commission. No, 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 it starts even earlier, starting in verse 18. You can start from verse 16, but that's just giving the setting in which Jesus is about to declare all that he is about to say. Verse 18, are you all there? Listen to this. Then Jesus came to them and said, Some authority. Is that what it says? How much is all? It's, it's everything, 100%. It's not 99.999. It's, it, Jesus is saying all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so even before the appeal for his disciples to go, he tells them, I have this authority. Very similar to the centurion who says, I also am a man under authority. I tell this soldier to what? Go. Is Jesus saying then in this passage to his disciples, I am under authority and I now command my soldiers, soldiers in Christ, men and women, to go. And the question is, will we have the same faith as this centurion to recognize that authority and to realize that this means that we aren't to just read this passage and go, well, that's great and all, that we should go? Or is this this a command from the commander of heaven saying, we are to go and make disciples, teach all the things that I have told you, the things that are written in this very book. You are to go and share with people because they need to know. They need to know what you have been privileged with. And so this is the fascinating part about it. Part of the reason why maybe the, Jesus was amazed by this centurion is because the centurion was modeling Jesus' own authority. Think about that. The centurion says, I am under authority. I command people to go, come, do this, do that. And they listen and obey. Jesus, in the end of this book, this gospel, says the exact same thing. It almost parallels it entirely. He says, I am under authority. This is the authority I have been given. No other name can lead to salvation. And so I tell you to go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Not just the Israelites, not just those who are privileged, but those who have not had the privilege you have. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Friends, I want to amaze Jesus. I want him to be amazed by my faith and by my actions. 
There's a verse in Luke 18 and verse 8. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find it? And the question is, is do you want to amaze Jesus today? Do you? I hear three people. They, three people only want to amaze Jesus today. Do you want to amaze him today? Do you want him to stand back in awe of what you have trusted and believed in him? Friends, there is one day, one day in which Jesus is going to come back and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But I wonder if we can just slightly change that a little bit. I think it expresses the same point, where Jesus comes to you and says, well done, I was amazed by you. Imagine hearing that. Oh, my goodness, I would break down, cast my crown, and go, no, 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 Lord, you're the one that's amazing. I'm not amazing. But yet he wants, like a parent would with their child, to lift up his child. He wants to lift you up and to exalt you, to also to be able to say, you had great faith. Enter into the kingdom. Friends, if that's your desire this morning, if you want to be a If you want Jesus to be amazed by you and your great faith, stand with me as we pray to close our service today. Let us pray, everyone. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for this story being being contained here in Scripture to help teach us and to lead us so that you may be amazed once again by our actions and by what we do and say. Lord, as we wrap things up here this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a measure of faith Even if it's as small as a mustard seed, Lord, we know that that mustard seed in your hands can grow into the biggest plant of them all. Lord, people have come here today to worship and to praise you this morning, and we are so grateful for that. Lord, I pray that as I have delivered this message, Lord. It will, come, it will have come with conviction into their hearts and that they would leave here desiring and saying, Lord, I want to amaze you this coming week. I want to amaze you with the things that I do, the people that I encounter with this week, Lord. Lord, let me share what's amazing about you. Lord, thank you. For all that you have done, all that you have blessed us with, the privilege that you have given us, help us not to be indifferent towards it, but to use it and to glorify you with what we do and what we say. This is my prayer. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.